Media Summit today. Hello everyone joining and um, please we'll get started in a few minutes please drop us some questions in the chat box and also let us know where you are coming to us from today. I'm in a hot air balloon over London right now planning to travel all around the globe if I can. I've been uh, to Australia today and to Prague already. Please do let us know where you're based. And you can use the chat function for that or the Q&A function if you prefer. <laughs> from Yorkshire, joining us from Yorkshire. Beautiful part of the world. I have to declare a personal interest, but it's a beautiful part of the world. And if you have any questions, please do drop some questions in the Q&A box or chat box if you have comments. And I'll try and I'm going to moderate today and I'll try and um, keep on top of um, the different messages that come up. So if you're just joining us, please do drop a question in the um, chat box and let us know where you're dialing in from today. Dialing in, videoing, dialing in. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here at the Global AdTech Media event, which is organized by SMART. I'm from ID5 and I'm in the hot air balloon from ID5 flying over London right now. Um, I have some panelists with me, but First of all, I thought I'd give you a short introduction to the issue. So my name is Joanna Burton and I run Strategy at ID5, which is a universal identity company, helping to solve the problem of advertising to, to consumers who are operating in environments where cookies are blocked, both now and in the future, where third party cookies are blocked. And I'll just give you a bit of background on this issue. There's a few um, tailwinds for our hot air balloon today, I would say. So today's discussion is really all about the very promise of digital advertising, the ability to target messages in a one-on-one -on -one basis to address each user individually, looking at that whole right time, right place, right message, right content, um, that whole approach, but also being able to optimize, optimize in real time, and being able to measure and attribute the results effectively. This is what gives digital advertising edge, uh, di digital advertising the edge, and explains the reason for the growth over the years, the rapid growth, as more and more users um, move online for their daily lives, as well as for all the entertainment and content they consume. But the problem is the reason we're here today is whilst advertisers and ad tech companies are announcing really sophisticated ways to target or to measure users, the whole subject is at risk at the moment due to a variety of regulatory, technical and commercial factors. One of those is regulation. In the last few years, the regulatory landscape has really changed with new legislation such as the GDPR coming into effect. ID5 was launched around the time of the GDPR but also see the California Privacy Act, the, all of these um, legislatively, legislatively changes, which are limiting the use of personal data, which we use in advertising. In addition to that, browsers such as Safari and Firefox have already blocked websites from reading and writing third party cookies. And then in January last year came the news from Google who have the biggest browser by market share Chrome and who said that they will stop supporting third party cookies in the Chrome browser within two years. So the within two years deadline will end on the 20th of January next year. So at some point, basically within the next, within the six, next six months, from what they said, and we're waiting on the news from them, but from what they said, we won't have access to third party cookies from January next year. And since 
that announcement last year, there's been a, a series of announcements from Apple on the IDFA limiting and other initiatives, and also more announcements from Google on how they plan to do this and their proposed alternative. And then in addition to all that, we already know that third party cookies, the, the methodology we use today, we know they, they face significant challenges. As we've spoken about this sharing personal data in the bid stream like this is not compliant with GDPR. The, it can also cause data leakage, sharing all this um, information from the publisher site to other third parties. Sharing third party cookies and syncing third party cookies can cause um, performance issues with page latency and this increases the more cookies are, are needed to be shared. And then finally, um, there's, a, there's a lost opportunity for, um, for publishers to monetize their audiences as at the moment, because with each ad tech platform they need to sync with, they need to sync cookies and the ad tech platforms need to sync cookies between them. And ultimately there gets a little bit of data loss between each sync and you end up with less opportunity for publishers to monetize their assets and less opportunities for advertisers and agencies to reach the specific people that they are looking for. And just to, to drill into that a little bit, what actually happens when we don't have access to third party cookies? Well, the analysis of users' behavior and um, the targeted delivery of advertising requires the user IDs that are stored in third party cookies right now. And then not only that, being able to frequency cap the number of times a specific message is shown to a specific user is done by counting the number of times that third party cookie is exposed to that advert. And then connecting the brand and the conversations they have with the publisher and the consumer across multiple sites is all done by using consistent user IDs that track across the, across the funnel and those user IDs are currently stored in third party cookies. So, bit bleak and as you could imagine this is why there has been so many headlines about this topic including um, more headlines today quite a few of headlines this week and why it's so important that we gather at events like this to discuss this kind of topic and try and hear from the experts and um, to see you know the different approaches to uh, being able to continue to identify to target to frequency cap and to measure users when we don't have access to the old methodology of third party cookies. There are a few solutions. Google has one solution. Another solution is to have shared user IDs, which are pseudonymous device identifiers designed to identify users across the web without the need to share cookies. ID5 has a, a solution along these lines and that's why I'm here today moderating this panel. These shared ID solutions can be created in two different ways. They can be created from declared identifiers when a user logs in and shares their email address, for example, um, and then that can be synced across multiple sites, or they can be created from inferred identifiers, basically the soft signals that are passed in the header um, that can be uh, used with an process by an algorithm to identify that unique user. Both of these options require uh, a website and a brand to have a conversation, to have a dialogue with their, with their customers. Now here with me today to discuss this, I have a, a, a panel joining me or a couple of experts joining me in the hot air balloon who I would like to introduce them, introduce to you now. First panelist, first expert is another Joanna. It's the first time for me to have another Joanna. Um, Joanna, please could you tell us a bit about yourself and your role and can you also tell us about piano keys? Sure. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Yeah, it's fun. We get to tag team with names. Um, first, thanks for, for having us. Second, I would not like to be labeled an expert, <laughs> maybe experimenter and, uh, and forming a point of view. Um, but it's a pleasure and, and really happy to be here uh, today and have this conversation. So I work for piano.io and I'm the chief growth officer there. And what Piano does is it actually helps organizations understand and influence customer behavior uh, by putting the power of insights and logic into the hands of their employees. Um, and, and, you know, we, we have a bit of connection on this panel, so hopefully we get to see how that's demonstrated today. Um, and, and we have this uh, analytics and activation platform, and what it does is it measures thousands of customer data points and uh, acquires first-party data you know, very relevant um, to more deeply engage 
users and then serve relevant content ex and experiences based on their unique behaviors and profiles. Uh, so, so that's really what we're about. Um, you know, we want to help our clients achieve scale, uh, in, increase engagement, obviously deliver more revenue, uh, and then improve the, the overall value of every digital interaction. And uh, in my role uh, for growth, I look after our partnerships as well as the development of new, new revenue streams. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Would you describe yourself as an ad tech company or tech company, MarTech? MarTech. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. And um, also in the hot air balloon to meet with me today is Andre from Ringier, Romania. Andre, welcome, welcome to the balloon, Andre. Um, we're just having a bit of fun with this hot air balloon. Can you? Yeah, thank you uh, very. Yeah. Go ahead, please introduce <laughs> yourself and let us know a bit about you, a bit about your role, like what your main objectives are at the company, and about Ringier, Romania, how you fit in with the wider group, please. Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me here today. So I'm the head of sales of Ring in Romania. I take care of everything related to the commercial initiatives that we have here in Romania and everything related to the business transformation the company goes through. As you all know, Ringe is a large publisher, uh, publisher here in Europe and also Ringe Romania is a large publisher in Romania. We have a, a vast variety of websites in Romania from classical content websites to marketplace. We run uh, two of the most popular marketplaces here in Romania, Immobiliare Dadro on, uh, on uh, real estate and eJobs on HR, that, you know, are very valuable from data point of view, just to continue what Joanna started, very valuable from data point of view when, when, it, when it comes to profiling and adding, and adding more accurate data to, you know, content behavior users. So again, very happy to be here and answer how, how we see the cookie-less future world with or without Google, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's, well, let's talk about that in a minute. So first yeah. of all, I just wanna say, I have some questions prepared, but I am happy to take questions from the audience. I'll keep an eye on the chat and the Q&A box. And maybe if I'm, I maybe other people on the panel can point me towards the questions if I miss them. Um, let's turn to you now, Andre, because you mentioned it. Can you give me your perspective on this topic, the with or without Google perspective? Can you explain how Ringe Romania is preparing, how you're preparing for this world without cookies in the future and how you're going to continue to monetize um, your traffic efficiently? So just to start how we are structured here in Romania. So we have close to 55 websites. So we are the largest pub publisher. We cover like uh, half of the online population during a normal week days so uh, it's a lot of pressure for us to deliver uh, you know uh, monetization as it is required in terms of how we see the cookieless uh, future uh, we started the project one year ago so we we took two trajectories at, at that point both of them very important and different in the same time but with some kind of intersection uh, and this was because of the client that we are targeting so on one hand because of our first party data and we work with piano dmp also present in this panel we work with piano dmp former CSS dmp because it's, this is how it's popular in romania we they have developed zero and first party identification so for us it was very important because they can save our first party data into this identification world and we are able to transform more our cookie data into identification data and further on push this data to direct clients, to our manager, to the direct business and IO business that we have. But this, because the way the Romanian market is structured, this only covers in a small percentage is our revenue needs. So we needed to find a solution. This was my thought a year ago. We needed to find a solution that can easily in an easy manner and scalable could save our all entire cookie inventory and further on push this identification into the programmatic ecosystem. So we need to rebuild an identification programmatic ecosystem parallel to the cookie programmatic ecosystem that could also work. Uh, the discussion I had then was with a two or three identification system. We believe we took the right choice back then, and I still, <laughs> and I still am confident in that. 
to work with ID5. So a combination, actually it's a combination of piano DMP0 and first party data with ID identification. And the third, if I may, there is an intersection that I said that we want here in Ringia, Romania to add on top of ID5 identification data layer from uh, piano DMP. So we can sell in programmatic world also IDs that we know about them since, what they read, where they do come from, so on and so forth. So these are our plans. Excellent. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, and, and thank you for saying you're pleased that you made your choice. Can I ask you, when you did the review of the market, what was the reason that you went for ID5? Uh, I remember I talked to three companies, two of them were very keen on pushing for a, a authentication. So because we, we, our email database was very low compared to our cookie database, let's put it this way, mm -hmm. an uh, authentication solution was not what we were looking for. So we needed a high accuracy probabilistic authentication solution. You know, so just the, as simple as ID5 works, the, put up uh, a script in the page and automatically does the entire process in background. So this is why we want uh, the, the high probabilistic uh, solution of ID5, which also works with authentication, but for us was very important to have the probabilistic part in place. Excellent, well, that's really clear. And can I just ask, Andre, how much of the revenue that you're seeing now is split between programmatic and non-programmatic? Um, I would say that uh, 35, 40% is coming from direct business, IOs, yeah, and agencies. And I think this is a pattern for Eastern Europe and 60, 65% comes from open programmatic. So this is why I thought that the, uh, the cookie less world in two directions, because on one hand, we need to a solution that could you know, easily be pushed into the ad manager to serve the clients and agencies, and the other one to serve the uh, open programmatic ecosystem. Very important was because not to have a new solution in our websites is because we wanted at the end of the day that the programmatic ecosystem to decrypt and use your IDs and uh, uh, the campaigns could run smoothly. So it was very important the decision criteria. So the programmatic could confirm, yes, we can use ID5 IDs. Yes, we can run media campaigns on ID5 IDs and so on and so forth. So we had this confirmation because we work close with uh, one of the largest uh, programmatic vendor here in Romania at Form that confirms the ecosystem works. Yeah. We're very grateful for our partnership with Adform. I mean, yeah, yeah. we have some great partners, including Piano, and we're very, and Smart, of course, and we're very grateful the partnership with Adform is working for us and for a lot of publishers and, and advertisers and agencies as well. So, so that's great. So you're able to, you're, you're prepared for the future and then also potentially looking to make the most and test and learn now while you have some users in browsers where the cookies are already blocked and you can compare that with where you, when you have third-party cookies right now? Uh, yeah, of course. So we we'll look at, you continuously look at the data. What, what we see here is like, we have on Chrome 65% market share in terms of user browsing, but almost 90% of the revenue goes on Chrome. So uh, the news really, <laughs> the, the, the Google Chrome news really shook up last year when they, when they openly, make it publicly. So this is why we took very serious this uh, identification ecosystem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What about you, jo uh, Joanna? Your clients um, at Piano were publishers, right? Is that right? Your clients are the publishers? Yes, we have, yeah, we have both. We have uh, publishers and non, but yes, I think okay. the, you know, right now our client base is the majority publishers. What does that mean, publishers and non? What's the non? Oh, we also work out of vertical. So we have uh, clients in e-com and financial okay. services and yeah. But we're talking about media owners, web owners on the, what yeah. we would call the supply side in ad tech. Which is okay. the majority of our client base. <laughs> Great. And then, and so, so with those companies then, how are you supporting them? What are the steps that Piano has taken to support these publishers and, and, and verticals mm -hmm. in preparing for the world where there are, won't be any third-party cookies? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think Andre kind of <laughs> did a nice tee up by talking about, you know, how we're working together and, um, you know, why I chose Piano DMP, because I think we've always been uh, about first party data. We were never a third party DMP. Um, it's always been important. And so for over a year now, we've really been um, trying to guide our clients, not just around the kind of first uh, party data acquisition, which as you also highlighted, Joanna, is more inferred, um, but also what you can do with declared data as well. Um, and the whole reason for doing this is, was to allow the buildup of rich customer profiles, um, which then enables uh, better targeting um, and uh, you know a better match in terms of the content that serves. So we've done a few things um, in this realm, both on the technical side and the strategic side. Um, on the strategic side, we're really helping you know helping our clients think through you know what are the strategies that you can use to collect data from users in a way um, that's going to make them have a relationship with you. You know if you think back to what got us here in the first place. Uh, trust is, is not really uh, at a high right now, and, and there was all sorts of data that was being collected. It, it's what kind of, as you, as you gave that timeline, um, what initiated the likes of GDPR and CCPA. So, um, you know, we really kind of have to put the, the kind of end user, the reader uh, from a publisher perspective right back at the center. Um, so that is part of it. Um, how do you, again, link to that? How do you use this um, this this content that you have, um, the ways that you engage from an offer's perspective to, to build value exchange. Um, and, and also you can't build relationship at a point in time. <laughs> it gets built over time. <laughs> so, you know, we've really been advocates of things like progressive profiling. Uh, and, you know, as we are partners with you, um, you know, we have thought a lot about the role of identity. Uh, there are different options that are out there. Uh, you know, we see kind of two priorities. One is to uh, partner with who we believe is uh, obviously very, uh, very serious in terms of how they take privacy and how they, they see the changes that are taking, taking place. And also with partners that we feel um, will allow us to, um, to technically deliver a, a sort of best breed solution um, that help, that makes it really easy. Right? This is a very big transition that we're going through and we want our clients to be able to experiment, to innovate and not get bogged down in terms of like technical, you know, the, the technical side. So we really want to try to make it easy. Um, we, about one month ago, we, we announced uh, in the press what is officially our first party data acquisition solution. And what this does is it, it unifies different parts of our stack uh, from data management to identity and then the customer journey orchestration capabilities that that piano has, and it's a bit of a one-stop stop shop. Uh, and you met you 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 mentioned at the beginning really important things, right? We need to go across the entire digital ecosystem. We want to prevent data leakage. We need to protect ad performance, right? Uh, as these third-party cookies go away, so that's what we're trying to do. Great. So it's clear to see why we're aligned. Now we have a question. Uh, so I'm going to read out this question from um, Marta. So, so Marta asks, um, I'm missing the understanding of how unified ID will protect the privacy of users once the user gives his data, the email, the phone number, the ID is created. Privacy question mark. So I'm going to start with that um, on the answer. So unified ID is a product name. What we're talking about today is universal ID, which is like a category of an approach. And I actually, I'm really grateful that you've asked this question, Marta, because I think it's something that a lot of people would like to know. So Unified ID is the name of a product and that product is um, focused on sharing email addresses. And I can't speak to that product, it's from another company. With Universal ID that we spoke about um, mm -hmm. earlier on today, this uh, works with both declared identifiers provided in Europe, the user has opted into those identifiers, those, the email that's then hashed and cleared to, created into an ID, provided the user has opted in, actively opted into that. And then uh, ID5 specifically, when we work with the soft signals shared in the header, like the um, timestamp and the URL and the IP address, just those soft signals crunched by our bespoke algorithm, we would only do that again if the user had opted in to sharing personal data, which is all integrated in the transparency and consent framework that the IAB Europe has built. So, in that case, if the user didn't opt in, 
we wouldn't have the right to, to um, work with them to create an ID and to link IDs across multiple sites, including the different sites at Ringier Romania. So we wouldn't be able to use it and therefore we wouldn't be respecting the, the user's privacy. So I think that's, uh, you know, I'm really grateful for the questions. So I think it's important. And Andre, I'm going to guess that for you, privacy and, be, and working with a solution that is compliant that can protect your data and also the data of your, the, protect your site from data leakage and also and protect the privacy of your users and your concerns was sort of uppermost in your review. Yeah, so for us, for us in Romania, so for us, the entire group actually, so privacy and GDPR compliances are very important. So it's like mandatory for us. So we cannot take any decision, no matter the, you know, the, 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 the potential of business without audited on the GDPR side. I know we went through the process for many months and it's all clear on our side. So, uh, I couldn't and I wouldn't speak about unified ID. It's another solution on another technology, which we didn't currently pursue. And I don't want to speak about unified ID. And uh, in terms of our cooperation, everything is checks positive. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's focus though on the privacy elements because that's in, that's of course important and um, really critical for you, Andre. And like I said in the slides at the beginning, our, our company launched around the time of GDPR, and I've heard of this this kind of um, uh, sort of GDPR present that we were given because all the companies around this time had to get up to speed with the GDPR. We will be ahead of all the legislation that comes in in the various different countries. Um, starting with California, but expected in Oklahoma, Florida, New York, and, and Canada's legislation looks very similar to the GDPR. And then, you know, we could talk about Brazil and Australia It's the important part of being a global company, I would say. What do you think, Joanna? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I agree as well. And I think it's, uh, it will be never ending our need to uh, stay up to date on what's happening, right? I mean, it's changing I'm sure you, you you each are having these conversations inside your company. I mean, you know, Andrea yeah. was talking earlier, right? You know, we're a bit on the hot seat. I think it's a fun job. That's why I said, you know, I'm not sure I want to be considered an expert because it's changing so much. I don't know how you become an expert. You're just happy that you, you know, you you really can keep keep on top of and keep track of what the changes are, you know. And and I think at being a global company, we're also a global company, so we work across the geos. And you know we do see differences. Yeah. Um, so we see, you know, in 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 Europe because of the GDPR uh, and just how seriously it's it's taken. Um, the conversation, I would say, the market has been a lot hotter. Uh, we're having many more conversations. Uh, the level of the detail level of technical questions uh, is much more ro robust than than in the U.S., uh, where I think. You know, obviously everyone's on top of it. I wouldn't say, you know, people know third party cookies are going away. We need to have a strategy, we need to do something, um, but it's a different type of conversation. It's, it's not nearly, um, you know, it, it's not nearly as detailed, I would say. Uh, and then in APAC, which surprises me, I spent 11 years in APAC before moving back to Europe. And I thought, you know, privacy has never been anywhere <laughs> radar in Asia Pacific, but you know it now is. It's it's there, and and the conversations in the last few months, obviously with the, the Google announcement, have heated up. Yeah, well, you tell me about that then, because um, we talked about the Google announcement. How do you see um, <laughs> this from a, a global perspective? How like how are you advising? Given you're a global company, how do you advise? The publishers in different regions and what sort of differences let's drill into that a bit more what sort of differences and differences of, of in approach do you see so i mean i think look in terms of our approach we're we're not that different we're fairly consistent in terms of what we feel is important um and i think we would always take a kind of client-centric view you know and and it, it's funny with the you know I, I have an ads background um i mentioned we're you know we're, we're we're a marketing technology company. We have a DMP, so we do advertising. We started with publishing. We had a really brilliant subscription <laughs> uh, offering. You know, we were really helping publishers to monetize. And so it's been interesting as, as these changes have taken place to see even internally, um, those that don't necessarily have a, an advertising background uh, question, you know, how do we go and talk about this with clients? And, you know, so it's a bit, it's a bit interesting for me having, having been in the, in the ad side and having seen um, how it's evolved. Well, it really depends on what the what the 
client wants to do, right? I mean, what, you know, you asked Andre the questions, you know, uh, what, what percentage is of his business is coming through uh, advertising versus subscription? You know, what does his programmatic composition look like? And so I think it's really understanding, you know, we will listen to what, what the customer needs and then we will adjust accordingly. And of course we have to take any local, um, you know, local market legislation, uh, and, and consumer behavior trends in, into effect. So, and that those will, those will be different and, and the dynamic with agencies and, uh, you know, who's leading from a, uh, from a DSP perspective, so to speak, right? Who are, who are the main, you know, sort of uh, tra training desks that things are going through. So that's kind of how we would think about it. And, and I think with, with Google, it's, it's definitely getting hotter, right? Everyone is testing it, um, and I, you know, I can't, I have to because we sit on, you know, we're kind of sitting on the news as it comes out on this stuff. Today, there was an article that was released in Digiday, and it's certainly worth a read. Um, and ID5, you know, founder and, and CEO Mathieu is quoted in it. But you know, it's interesting. It will be interesting to see what happens, right? And I don't know if Andre is testing block. We, we, we can maybe ask him, depending on if he if he feels like answering that question, but. You know, I was having a conversation with a client this past week. They're testing it. They feel they have to test it. Uh, we were hearing the same thing from publishers in the U.S. And, you know, Digiday today, I'll just quickly quote them. You know, they said something which was, this is what they wrote. I'll quote it. You know, the flock ID assigned to people is updated weekly, which is meant to filter them into gradually evolving collectives. What's interesting about the article, by the way, is that they're now calling it a flock ID and seemingly limit a flock ID's use as a persistent identifier. Furthermore, because the system works automatically inside web browsers like Google Chrome, Google does not precisely define how it assembles cohorts and the company does not supply labels to reveal what their supposedly opaque codes represent. So I think, you know, here we are going towards transparency and thinking about privacy. And, you know, you heard Andre quote, right? What did you say? 90, 95% of your revenue is tied to that. And, uh, and, you know, they're kind of writing their own rules. So I'm curious to see what happens. I would definitely say writing their own rules and also the transparency issue is really important because how can users don't know what collective they're in and how can they opt out or actively opt in there's a lot of questions do you want to comment on it andre um not really is because of the, the information is very new and fuzzy actually i don't have anything you know, precise to say so we are a practical company we need to have you know clear information for us to take decision i mean is and we are always going to pursue the, the revenue stream, so the revenue source. So it doesn't matter for us if it comes through Flock, Fledge, whatever technology. For us, it's important to, you know, to, to get the clients the reach and the performance they want. Right. So I'm more of technology agnostic on this side. I'm more towards the benefits of the clients. So this is why recent news, I miss them. Sorry, <laughs> I miss them. But uh, since it's not a... Google official announcements because we have our uh, uh, liaison with our Google account that keeps us informed about this stuff. I don't, I don't take it very seriously yet. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that you make that point. You need, you, you don't want something fuzzy. You want something concrete yeah. and real that's working now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good point, and that's clear. So what sort of questions? What sort of questions do you get from agencies and from advertisers and from DSPs, Andre, that you could uh, that you get now that you're that you're able to address now? The kind of questions around data. The actually, real I questions. don't get. Actually, I don't get around uh, around data. I get questions. So the accuracy, the volume. Uh, how do we procure those data? Is there you know legally safe so on and so forth? But we went through this. So we, we work with Piano since four or five years ago. So all the market is working with Piano towards the same client. So all those questions were processed one, and answered one by one for each publisher, for each client through the agencies. We made at some point one workshop a year where we presented to the clients all the options they had in how to run data layers campaign. So I think we are safe on that side. When it comes to identification, that's a new new territory i try to have some conversation i think they are not so interested in the product rather than in benefits so the 
hmm. the feedback was like really simplistic. So, okay, I don't care how you made the wind turbine on the BMW engine. I care if the benefits are the same or better for me. So if I were a client, probably I'll have the same answer. So don't bother me with all the background noise. Give me the real stuff when it's ready. Don't call me until then. So this is what I did. So I stopped the, you know, because I wanted like, you know, put ring here like, um, like, you know, in some kind of market advantage because we did this integration. And I wanted the clients, okay, we already did this integration. We have a data layer. We have identification push for more campaigns so they said okay we are not interested necessarily in the infrastructure or the carrier of our banner of our message of our creative we are more interested in the you know results and the performance mm -hmm. so that really changed a little my optics so why bother them with uh, fuzzy information noise or whatever information they don't really care about because facebook or google does not go to the clients and tell them we have a flock id which is it's not GDPR compliant, but it is GDPR compliant. Depends what outlet you read. <laughs> uh, so this is why. So yeah. less on the technical noise and more on the you know real benefits for the client. So that's why I changed the perspective. So I consider the digital environment to be very busy in buzzwords and you know technical details, on and so forth. But identification, this new whatever task that we have, it's even more complicated than the general digital market. So that's why I'm doing this shift in my speech towards the clients. I think that makes a lot of sense. So yeah, that classic ad tech issue of uh, coming up with a load of jargon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, it's incumbent on us all to try and speak as clearly as we can and, and focus on the benefits. It's a good reminder, Andre. Yeah, a good point. But I also think, you know, an agency and a brand shouldn't really have to worry about this. This is an infrastructure issue. We should be able to fix this uh, for the publishers and for the advertisers by collaborating with the um, ad tech companies and the tech companies, the martech companies, so that we can all um, uh, fix that problem and go on our business as normal. Same, you know, they don't need to know what engine it is in the BMW. I think I've had a call with you in your BMW, Andre. <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> they not, don't need not, to know about yeah. the engine. They just don't need to know everybody. the car goes fast. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> they just need to know the car works. So um, yeah, but here we, we need to like divide the clients. So they are really very interesting clients in technology like Procter & Gamble, for example, which we yeah. have like current discussion about this. They have their own data and programmatic ecosystem. So they probably are working on this to recreate the, the identification or rely on the publisher identification ecosystem on one hand. And then, and probably there is a number of 10, 5, 15 clients similar to Procter and Gamble. And then there is the long tail of clients, 90%, whatever of the clients that, uh, you know, they are very direct about this. So come to me when it's ready because I have ways to spend my money. So it's your job as a publisher and identification technology and data technology to create this environment. Otherwise, I have where to put my money and reach the same yeah. audiences or even better with yeah. Google and Facebook, YouTube, recently TikTok and whatever other options are there. Yeah, for sure. And now with fully logged in users and a rich data trail. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about... Um, about targeting and applying data for targeting, but there's a, I think there's a, a big unknown in the terms specifically around measurement and attribution. Mm. And once the, in, the industry doesn't have access to third party cookies anymore, how is, this, how is this going to continue to work? So Joanna, can you weigh in with your perspective on that and, and where you think these changes are heading? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, look, I think measurement has always been, uh, you know, if, if we had to grade ourselves, it's always been the one that's been, you know, attribution in particular. Uh, I'm not talking about kind of uh, classic cost of measurement, uh, you know, has always been slightly, uh, slightly challenged. Um, so I would say, given this, let's really focus on the known. You know, we know what matters here to measure. Uh, campaign reporting, you heard Andre talk about it, um, the, the consistent, um, you know, uh, KPIs of viewability, reach, click-through rate, um, segment performance, 
Um, these will remain uh, important. Uh, we think that because we're advocating for sort of more precise targeting, you'll see an overall decrease in, uh, in impressions, but a better performance in terms of click-through rate. That's what we are hoping for, right? Um, and, and we've, ch we've chatted, chatted about this. Um, match rate, we talked about identity, we talked about the importance of it. So this is also going to be important to look at, um, you know, how, how recognizable and how, how many of these IDs are recognized by brands. Um, how does the match rate pre and post uh, third party cookie going away? Uh, how, how do those compare? Um, and so, you know, what and what does it do? Does is our ad effectiveness maintained? So that's another one. And then, of course, I did another really key area that we're looking at, and, and hopefully this is something that would help Andre, is revenue attribution reporting. Um, so what is revenue generated from the ads uh, look like? Uh, and then how can you attribute that revenue to page views, users, segments, content types? This is a real area of focus for us from a product development standpoint right now. So uh, we feel this is, is super important. Yeah, it does sound really important. Sorry, Andre, did you want to weigh in too? No, I just said nice about the, the future product development. So I, a, a, anything you have to make me look good in front of my boss, please send it to. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, wanted, I wanted to actually ask you, Andre, do you feel like, you know, you mentioned the likes of the PNGs and your clients in general who are like, you know, show me, show me the results, so to speak. And, you know, I, I've, I've worked mostly with brands, right? So I've worked a lot advertiser side and then I've sat in an agency and, and, and they're also servicing brands. And I, I think publishers has, have always been a bit on the on the back foot, you know, uh, they've been at a bit of a, at a disadvantage, and now I feel like this is great, you know. Finally, we're having a bit more of a rebalancing, and so do you feel that you know you've invested a lot and you got out ahead of this change? Um, you you um, you know you had a very clear strategy, so I'm just wondering, are you happy with how it's paid off? Do you feel that you're able to um, to demonstrate that value more now than than you would have been? So there, I think there are two sides to look at this. On one side, we are we are doing anything possible. There is a noise in the background. I don't know if it's from me. Maybe or mine. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. Do you hear it or is it just in my head? So it's a noise in my head. <laughs> it's your BMW roaring. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to look at. It's, so it's one side we do everything that stands in our you know capabilities to develop our products both from content technology and delivery standpoint so from this we always want to keep an edge in front of the market just to be you know ahead of the curve and implement new tools new products just to to show performance to clients uh, this on one hand second we are half of our strategy development plan, so we are not there yet. So I couldn't say now that we are ready and we are, you know, exceeding our targets and KPIs, so on and so forth. We still have things to do to implement, considering where I want to take Ring Romania. Uh, but we always fight against, you know, Google and Facebook combined with uh, YouTube and TikTok that... They grow with powerful, you know, very accurate tools that a normal publisher could not fight with. So unless you are a big publisher in one country, then, you know, invest continuously invest in technology. As a normal publisher, you will not ever be able to, to compete. It's, it's a difficult word, you know, to be at the same table or whatever with this giant. So given that, Andre, final question, because I, 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 if there are yeah. any more questions, I will take them from the audience just so I can sneak them in. But final question from me, um, as an industry, what do you think um, we need to do as an ad tech industry to support publishers? And I'll start with you, Andre, and then if you could take us out, Joanna. Can you start with Joanna? So I need to- Okay, sorry, <laughs> give you some time. So, so Joanna, the question is like, as an industry, like how can we support publishers? It to prepare for this cookie-less world? Yeah, so I mean, look, I think uh, test and learn, you know, you heard the investment 
that that Andre spoke to, and we're seeing this again. We're seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of experimentation um, from you know I would say the ones that we think are leading. Um, so I think that's important. I think collaboration. We really need to collaborate. You know, we're really intrigued by the alliances that exist uh, in in Europe, uh, the conversations that are being had there. Uh, we're curious to see where those goes. We're, we're also curious to see. You know, the U.S. has has never really operated like that as a market, though there are you know there are grumblings and so um, and there are discussions and so we're we're interested in that. But I, I think it's really a time, you know, to. Um, to, to level the playing field as much as we possibly can, right? And, and the ways that we'll do that is um, making sure that people know what the options are and that they take some time now, not like in Q4 of January of next year to, to when, this, when the switch gets flipped to, to kind of have a sense of this is what really works for us as a business. Yeah, so I can advice. answer from the, yeah, I can answer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I can answer from Romania perspective. So. Uh, now in Romania, let's put it this way, we don't have a national plan of rescue, the, 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 the third party cookies world. So there is none in place. We have some different talks and we are in plan to do it, but there is no national plan. I would say we are the ones that are a little ahead of the curve, but I would like the industry to have a faster adoption of these technologies because we have now six months in place to deadline. And uh, if there are not enough companies, not enough tests run, not enough campaigns delivered, measured mm -hmm. properly, we cannot go fully go to the clients and say, okay, we did this. Exactly. We won the deadline with Google. We did this. Now you can, uh, you can still deliver campaigns through identification and ecosystem. So I don't think we have this yet. So I don't think it's the second point of mine. I don't think it relates only to Romania, but I think it's a general faster adoption kind of uh, uh, need from the publisher and technological side. I think you, that Maybe. you, yeah, no, I think you both make really good points there. We need faster adoption. We need to test and learn. We need to make the most of this window of opportunity. Guys, thank you so much for your expert opinions. Seriously, I think that you've really shared some like really genuine experiences of where you're at on this journey and 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 I hope that it's been really helpful for the audience I, I I've seen that some of the people that we have online so we have some publishers and we have some some uh, some DSPs and some agencies and advertisers dialing in so I hope the message is clear thank you so much for sharing your thoughts um it's been fun to have you in the ID5 hot air balloon <laughs> going between Amsterdam and London and Bucharest and <laughs> all around a hot air balloon of identity. And I really want to thank Smart for inviting us to participate. It has been brilliant to be part of the global ad tech media event. I really look forward to the next one. And with that, I wish everybody goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. So Ciao, much. goodbye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>